Okay, it's time to embark on the latest iteration of our Jewish journey through the Gospel of John. In order for us to move forward, we need to take one step backward and see where we've been because this is a cumulative journey and particularly where we are in this passage, the words of Jesus build upon one another. So let's make sure we're all on the same page. And so let's ask ourselves what happened previously on a Jewish journey through the Gospel of John. What we finished last week was the core of the Upper Room Discourse, which I call uh, PTSD, Yeshua's Pre-Traumatic Stress Discourse. This is the conversation, the core of the conversation, the crux of the conversation that went on during the uh, Last Supper, the Passover meal during dinner. And it was pre-traumatic because as soon as Yeshua is going to be arrested, just a few hours, uh, there is going to be a tremendous amount of trauma. Certainly when he's taken out to the cross to be crucified, the disciples, the apostles will be under a great deal of stress. And so Yeshua spent uh, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, thus far, this lengthy discourse preparing his disciples. So the upper room discourse, you'll remember is broken up into six components. The heart of the Upper Room Discourse is found in 14, 15, and 16. And so we move from Yeshua's immediate concern as he begins uh, his discourse to comfort his followers, to comfort his disciples, to move from comfort. He spends a long time there, 31 verses in that, uh, in that mode, mode of comforter. Then we move from comfort to emphasizing a strong and abiding connection and dependence from the disciples on Jesus. So a connection to Jesus. We then move to Yeshua warning his disciples that they will experience contention in the world. They move from contention to conviction, what is it they must believe, what is it that they do believe, from conviction, realizing that something is about to go down, not perhaps realizing the extent to which it's going down, but understanding that their master, that their Messiah, that their rabbi is about to leave them, the Yeshua moves to consolation. So just as he began with comfort, he's now reinforcing with consolation, this in turn leads to uh, apostolic comprehension as the upper room discourse ends. The upper room discourse, then the heart of it completed, Yeshua emphasizing that he came forth from the Father and have come into the world. This is the Gospel of John in a nutshell. I'm leaving the world again and going to the Father. So Yeshua has a round trip ticket. as a return ticket and he's about to punch that ticket and return to the Father. That is the Gospel of John. Behold, an hour is coming. This is how he leaves his disciples. An hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered. This is what's going to happen to you. This is the traumatic stress that I've been preparing you for, each to his own home and to leave me alone. But yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. The identification of Yeshua with the Father, the um, relationship, the intensity of that relationship, when you have one, you have the other together, is emphasized here. This is what he is making sure that his disciples know. The last things that he shares with his disciples. These things I've spoken to you. This is why I gave you the upper room discourse. So that in me, you may have peace. Not trauma, not stress, but peace in the midst of stressful trauma. Because in the world, you have tribulation. That's a certainty. That's a sh that's, take it to the bank. But take courage because I have overcome the world. That is a tremendous 
encouragement to the disciples and to all of those of us who have followed Yeshua down through the centuries, the millennia, that in the world, yes, trauma, stress, tsuris, we say in Yiddish, but take courage, Yeshua has overcome the world. We looked at 1 John 5 last time. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. I'm born of God and so are you if you are a follower of Yeshua. And therefore, if he's overcome the world, we too can overcome the world, have overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. The moment we exercise faith in Yeshua is the moment that we have experienced victory. We must just live in the victory that Yeshua has wrought for us, won for us. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe. Do you believe that we are overcomers? We have overcome the world. They can't throw anything at us that's going to knock us off our position as followers of Yeshua as overcomers, as victors. John 1, way, way back in the prologue, that overture to the gospel where all the great themes of the gospel are laid out. But as many as received him, that's me, I hope that's you, to them he gave the right to become children of God. I believe in rights. I believe in human rights that are given by our creator. And one of those rights, if we believe, if we receive Yeshua, it is a right to become a child of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I'm born of God, and so are you, if you're a follower of Yeshua. Who will separate us, Paul writes in Romans, and I think this is so appropriate as a, uh, as a coda to what John has given us here, what Jesus has left us here in the upper room, who will separate us from the love of our Messiah? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? We're a world under duress right now, under peril and have been for quite some time. Is any of that, is the quarantine going to separate us from the Lord? No, because we may be quarantined, but he's not quarantined. Yeshua is not quarantined. Nobody can, nobody can put God in a box. And so there is nothing the world can throw at us. Disease, economic hardship, that's where the famine, the nakedness come in, the peril, the sword. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. Not just squeak through, but we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Not because we're so awesome, but because we have a savior. We have a prince. We have a ruler who has blazed the trail before us and has won the victory. All we're doing is marching behind him. So, what we're going to see now, beginning in chapter 17, is Jesus' prayer. And it's a lengthy prayer. It takes up the entire chapter of 17, 26 verses. We're not going to finish it all today. But we can think of it as a punctuation mark right on the end of the upper room discourse. It is a loving punctuation mark that completes the thoughts and ties everything together in the Upper Room Discourse. We can think of Yeshua, we don't often think of Yeshua this way, as a paraclete, but we think, of course, of the, the Ruach Kodesh as the paraclete, as, a, as the helper, as the uh, advocate, as the comforter. But remember, uh, Yeshua told us in John 14, verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another paraclete, another helper, another advocate, another comforter, in addition to me, in other words, that he may be with you forever. I'm leaving you, but I'm not going to leave you bereft. I will send you an additional comforter, an additional 
advocate. And so what we see in this prayer is Yeshua really for the, for the last formal time with his disciples acting as their advocate, acting as their uh, jag, as their uh, uh, comforter, as their helper, as their defense uh, attorney. The prayer itself can be broken into three components. The prayer begins with Yeshua's prayer for himself. It's always best to pray for yourself first, right? Take care of your personal concerns. And then from there he moves on uh, to his apostles, to his immediate followers, those to whom he is passing his torch, the torch. And from there, he moves on to praying for future believers, the fruit of the original apostles. So five verses for himself. Then from 17, 6 through 19, he prays for the apostles that they will be able to succeed in his absence. And then praying, knowing that the disciples will succeed, he prays for their fruit, for the future believers that are going to come forth from those original band of apostles, verses 20 through 26. We can think of the prayer of Yeshua in the Upper Room Discourse, we can think of it as a special clips episode. Oftentimes when we watch TV programs every now and then, I know some of you don't watch TV, but some of us do, uh, and oftentimes there is a special episode that comes uh, sometime after the show's been on for a while. Uh, maybe the lead actors need a little bit of a break. Uh, and so they create a, uh, a clip episode that references, it has a basically just a, a basic skeletal structure. And it's just basically an excuse to go back and show greatest hits of previous episodes. So remember how long the show has been on? Do you remember when that happened? And all of a sudden we get that clip. This is a special clips episode of John's Gospel for thematic reinforcement. I find that the prayer of Jesus works beautifully this way as a special clips episode for thematic reinforcement to remind us of where we've been. And so we are going to be stopping uh, periodically, frequently, throughout the prayer of Jesus, we're going to be interrupting and say, remember when Jesus said this earlier in the Gospels? Remember the context in which Jesus said this? Well, let's build upon this and let's keep going. So let's proceed. Jesus spoke these things. Verse 1, spoke what things? Verses uh, or chapters 14, 15, and 16, the heart of the upper room discourse. And immediately after Jesus spoke these things, Lifting his eyes to heaven. Now, it's an interesting thing regarding prayer. When we think about praying, uh, we have all different kinds of postures in the scripture. A standing prayer, kneeling prayer, prostrate prayer, all a variety of postures. But one thing that's, uh, that's never specified in scripture is praying with your eyes closed. Do you pray with your eyes closed? I bet you do. I often do as well. Not in the car though. That can lead to a non-prayerful outcome. Uh, but uh, off because it closes off distractions and it's helpful. But Yeshua, and the only time that uh, it tells us that Yeshua prayed, it, oh, it indicates that he prayed with his eyes open. And that is often, that's the only uh, posture for the eyes that scripture knows regarding prayer. Not that closing your eyes for prayer is wrong. It's just that if we're going to be biblical, eyes open, looking to heaven. Jesus spoke these things, lifting his eyes to heaven. He said, Father. So the prayer begins with Yeshua identifying the recipient of the prayer, the destination of the prayer. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Now, this is pregnant with information. 
an important reference to previous passages. First of all, the concept of hour. Throughout the Gospel of John, we've seen the hour is soon, the hour is coming. Uh, way back in chapter 2, the hour is not yet come. All of a sudden, we see in John 12, Jesus answered them saying, that hour which hadn't come, it was not yet, not yet. Well, the hour has come. And that hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So beginning in chapter 12, this is with Passover. With the arrival of Passover, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And he continues in verse 27 of chapter 12. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. So Yeshua Recognizing the hour has come, he embraces that the hour is now here. And then, of course, in the next chapter 13, verse 1, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So you have, in a very short space, a rat a tat tat, a boom, 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 one, two, three, of the hour has come. It's now here. And so as we recognize that the hour is here and nobody is more aware of the hour being here than Yeshua himself, what is Yeshua's petition for himself? First five verses, he prays for himself. What is, what, what is it that he's asking the Father? What is Yeshua's petition for himself? Jesus spoke these things. Father, the hour has come. Here's what his petition is. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. So the prayer, the petition is for his own glorification, but ultimately not for the son's glory, so that the son may return and glorify the father. So Yeshua, always concerned to glorify the Father, realizing that the only way that he is able at this point to glorify the Father is through the Son being glorified through what's going to occur in the next few hours. Even as you gave him authority. So just as you gave who? Who's him? The Son. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Look at how pregnant each verse is in this prayer. This is the very words of Jesus. So, of course, they're going to be resplendent with theological concepts. So, you gave him, got a couple things to look at here. You gave him authority over all flesh. Really? When did that happen? Uh, and to all whom you have given him. In other words, if you are following Yeshua, it's not because you chose him. It's because the Father chose you and gave you to the Son. So that the Son, having received the gift from the Father of you, the Son may then return and give eternal life to you. So it's a beautiful circle. So authority over all flesh, the Father has chosen and given the disciples to Yeshua. Yeshua, having received that gift, is going to give a gift of his own to give his followers eternal life. This is a shout out to so many different passages. Let's take each component one by one. First of all, the authority issue. At what point and when was the authority over all flesh given to the Messiah? First of all, from eternity past, but Daniel references this in 7, verses 13, 14, a familiar passage, and it's where we get the concept of the bar inash, Aramaic, for son of man, which you'll remember is Yeshua's favorite self-designation, son of man. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, one, like a son of man, was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days, the Father, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, 
and a kingdom. So this human-like figure, someone who sure looks very human, in the clouds with God is given by God dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language, all flesh. In other words, as it's put in John, might serve him and his dominion. This is the Son of Man's dominion. Is an everlasting dominion. In case you don't know your vocabulary today, what an everlasting dominion is, it simply repeats and says, which will not pass away. In other words, a kingdom that will not pass away. Kingdom with no end. And his kingdom is one which will not pass be destroyed. Three different ways of saying the same thing, that this son of man figure uh, that God gives all this authority to, when he possesses the authority, it is permanent authority. So that's the idea of the son of man. Now Yeshua has built this idea and and built on this idea uh, regarding his own authority over all flesh. Back in chapter 5, verses 21, 23, 24. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Choice of the Son, because he has all authority over all flesh. And he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So another point in John's gospel, and again, I'm not making this up. I'm simply uh, quoting what Jesus himself, what Yeshua himself claimed. If you do not honor the Son, you don't honor the Father who sent him. So you cannot claim to honor God and do an end run around Jesus. The only way to the Father is through the Son. You want to worship the Father? You want to worship God? You want to worship the creator of all? You must honor the Son. They are a package deal in John. And again, that's not me. I didn't make that up. I'm not creating a thesis. I'm simply reporting and reciting, quoting accurately, the words of Yeshua. Truly, truly, amen, amen. We know this phrase well. Take it to the bank. I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but is passed out of death into life. So Yeshua gives life but you must believe in him because if you believe in him, you believe in the one who sent him which is the Father. For just as the Father has life in himself, skipping now to 5, 26 and 27, just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave the Son also to have life in himself. When I say in, in himself, it means intrinsic power. This is intrinsic power. It's built into the formula of who Yeshua is, of who the Father, just as God is God, so too Yeshua possesses the attributes of his father, intrinsic authority to have life in himself and gave him that intrinsic authority to execute judgment. How come, you may ask? Because he is the son of man. That's why we let off with the Daniel chapter 7 passage because that's where this concept is found in the Hebrew Bible because Yeshua is the son of man. Now, if you reject the idea that Yeshua is actually the son of man that Daniel speaks of, then uh, you're not, it's not going to make sense to you because you're not recognizing. But if you, if you associate the two together, then it makes perfect sense. Going forward to John 10 regarding giving eternal life, And having that authority, my sheep, my disciples, hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them. How come I give eternal life? Because I have the authority to do so. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Not only do I have the authority to give my disciples eternal life, but I have the power and the authority to secure that salvation. No one will snatch them out of my hand. 
hand. They are secure in my love and in my possession. My Father, who has given them to me, that should be familiar because Jesus references this concept. They have been given to me by you is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand or the Father's hand. Hand. So if you follow Yeshua, you are secure both in Yeshua's hand and in his Father's hand as well. That is a double certainty. I like double knots. They're fantastic because then your shoelace is not going to untie while you're walking down the street and you could possibly uh, miss the shoelace being untied and you're walking along very happily and all of a sudden you find yourself flat on your face, right? So I tie a double knot because I like the security. Jesus promises there is security, double security in our salvation, both his hand and the Father's hand. Going on with Yeshua's prayer, verse 3, this is eternal life. Here's what's meant by eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, I don't believe that that's, it's possible that I'm wrong. But the way I read this is that Jesus, <laughs> it would be very rare, it was very rare, I, I haven't found it elsewhere in the scripture where Jesus refers to himself with his title. Jesus, like in the third, third person. Uh, some politicians speak like that decades ago. You know, it was a funny thing when uh, the guy running for president, Bob Dole, used to refer to himself, well, Bob Dole doesn't feel that way. Who's Bob Dole? I am. Uh, uh, Jesus doesn't speak like that of himself in the third person. I think what we have here is a, uh, a parenthesis. This is John's parenthesis. Jesus is speaking of eternal life. John pops in the narrator, helpful narrator, and by the way, when we're talking about eternal life, because that's really, remember, what John's big concern in writing the gospel, this is written, so that you may believe that you may have eternal life. So John wants you to make sure you understand what eternal life is. This is eternal life. Here it is. That, you, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, whom you have sent. So whether this is a parenthesis and the narrator is speaking or whether this is part of Yeshua's uh, uh, prayer, this is the definition of eternal life right here. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, the Messiah, whom you have sent. Now eternal life, that is such a hot topic in our culture. Oh my goodness. There's a, a popular program on the TV, been on the TV for several years, called The Good Place. And even in reruns, I know people really enjoy this comedy. It's all about the afterlife. It's all about what eternal life is like, as imagined by the good writers at NBC. Take that for what it is. Uh, and then there's a new one, just came on Amazon, called Upload, Live Your Best Digital Afterlife. I started watching this program. I'm only one episode in, so don't spoil it for me. But nonetheless, the whole point is, what is a digital eternal life going to look like? Eternal life is certainly something that is uh, occupying the imaginations of our writers and creative uh, people in Hollywood. But that's really not what Yeshua is getting at, the, uh, the place that you're going to live or uh, the beautiful uh, scenery that you're going to be looking at uh, in your eternal dwelling. Yeshua is going for a more relational position. As Donald Carson, D.A. Carson, in the fantastic commentary, writes, eternal life is not so much everlasting life, as personal knowledge of the everlasting one. So the Hollywood programs all focus on the destination. What is heaven like? That's not John's focus, and it's not Jesus' focus when he speaks of eternal life. It's not the location, the destination. It's the relationship that eternal life brings with Yeshua and God. 
To know God is to be transformed, Carson says, and thus to be introduced to a life that could not otherwise be experienced. Knowledge of Jesus Christ, whom God has sent, is the ultimate access to knowledge of God. So eternal life is less about destination, more about relationship and understanding, truly knowing God, not knowing about God. I went to seminary six long years, and when I graduated, I knew a whole lot about God, spent the rest of my life getting to know God. No one has seen God at any time, John 1 says in the prologue, verse 18, the only begotten God, that would be Yeshua, who is in the bosom of the Father, that's the Son. He has explained him. So if you want to know God, if you want to understand God, there's only one means and the only one person that you go to, you're going to go to Yeshua, right? So if you had uh, in your house, if you had a whole lot of supernatural ghost activity, right, and ghosts, poltergeists or whatever were, were haunting you, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters, right? Um, if your Maytag goes out uh, and uh, uh, you can't do laundry anymore, who are you going to call? The Maytag repairman. If you want Kentucky Fried Chicken, who are you going to call? There's only one place you can go, and that's to the colonel. You want to know God, you have to go to, come to Jesus. You have to come to Yeshua because it's only he who has explained him. It's part of the new covenant. We looked at Hebrews 8 well, two weeks ago, maybe. Uh, and this is a quotation from Hebrews of Jeremiah 31, uh, verses uh, 33 and 34. Uh, this is, speaking of new covenant, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord in contradistinction. Remember to the Mosaic covenant made on Sinai, which your fathers couldn't keep, right? I will put my laws into their minds. It'll be an internal, internal system. I'll write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. We will have an intimate relationship such as never been seen before between creator and created. That's part of the new covenant. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord, here's how to know God. For they shall all know me. They shall all, in other words, be in relationship with me. Experiential relationship from the least to the greatest. When the Bible speaks about how to know somebody, you know, we're, you know say, knowing in the biblical sense, it has to do with close, personal, intimate relationship. And that is what eternal life is all about. You, know, you get all this and heaven too. You get heaven, you get everlasting life, yes, but eternal life begins right now with, your, with faith and an intimate knowledge, relationship of who Yeshua is. Verse 4, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. So Yeshua has glorified his Father. How? Because I accomplished all the work that you've given me to do. So the Father gave the Son a job, a mission, a task, and Yeshua has exercised those protocols. He has stayed on task and successfully accomplished what the Father has given him to do. Yeshua references this all the time. John 3, 17. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So task number one is whatever you need to do, it winds up being that he's got to live a perfect life uh, and uh, in complete holiness and then give himself as a sacrifice for the many uh, and then come back from the dead. But that's how the world will be saved. And indeed, that is... Mission accomplished. And Yeshua speaks in the prayer as if what he's about to do, which is give himself, surrender himself to uh, sacrifice his life, that 
it's so certain that it's so certain that's, that it's already done. It's like the amen, amen, right? Jesus doesn't have to say amen at the end of a prayer because when he speaks, it's absolutely certain. He front loads the amen. And so he speaks absolutely with power and certainty. Jesus said to them, chapter 4, my, my food <laughs> is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. When Yeshua was talking about this, chapter 4, is still in the midst of accomplishing his work. There was still much, much more in his ministry to accomplish. Chapter 5, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, that I'm doing right now, right? It was, that's what Yeshua's ministry was about, accomplishing what the Father had given him to do, staying on task and accomplishing this. Testify about me that the Father has sent me. In John 19, Spoiler alert, uh, Jesus is taken to the cross. Uh, and uh, his final words in John, therefore when Jesus had received the sour wine, John 19, 30, he said, it is finished. What is finished? All that the Father had given him to do was accomplished. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Verse five, now Father, glorify me Together with yourself, package deal, remember. But glorify me together with you, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So, what glory? The Shekinah glory that belonged to the, to the second person of the Trinity, that belonged to the Son from time immemorial. Bring that back. The glory that I had with you before the world was, before I created. Remember, all that has been created, he created, and nothing's been created that he didn't create. John 1 1, more basic than that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That glory. The glory that belonged to the Son prior to the incarnation. Paul speaks of it beautifully in Philippians 2. Who, speaking of Yeshua, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, grasped onto, in other words, white-knuckled, but he willingly emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. In other words, taking on human flesh, incarnation. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Not up to the point, but to the point. He died, came back to life. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So what is Yeshua praying for? Praying for a reset of, of the glory? No, no, it's not, a, it's not a reset. Push the reset button and bring me back to what I was prior to the incarnation. No, because Yeshua never goes back to what he was prior to the incarnation. He doesn't give up his physical form. When you see Yeshua, one day we will see him. We will see him, and he will still bear the nail scars on his arms and on his feet. It doesn't give up his... So it's not a reset button. Nor is it like your computer where you, if you mess up windows or you mess up things, you can reformat and you can get it back factory fresh. No, Yeshua is never going to become factory fresh. The cross, the sacrifice, and the glorification that follows the resurrection are always going to be part of his history. He doesn't need to be refurbished no, what's happening, what's happening to Yeshua and what he prays for is that he is restored upon return. He is about to make a return and that glory 
that once was his, now in an incarnated body, that glory, he prays, to be restored upon return. Verse 6, we now move from Yeshua petitioning God regarding himself to petitioning God for his apostles. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. Now I want you to see a couple things here. You're going to see in the next verses and even next week, because we're not going to finish today, um, you see the concept of the world. And in the world, of the world, out of the world. Prepositions to you may be a very small thing. Well, they're a small thing to me too. Two letters, three letters. But nonetheless, uh, they carry a tremendous weight. So uh, when we think about the world, we're going to be moving from out of the world, in the world, and of the world. I have them highlighted appropriately. So Yeshua manifested, he revealed, he exhibited God's name to the men, not to the women, <laughs> to, to his inner gang, the 11 apostles, whom you gave me out of the world. What is the world? That system that stands in opposition to God and to his son, right? So these men were in the world. They were in the world. They're human beings, apostles. Right? We got to know them in the Gospels. Yeah, Peter, James, John, Andrew, got a whole bunch of them. And God took them out of the world, right? Didn't remove them, but he removed their allegiance. He changed their allegiance and gave them to Yeshua. So the men you gave me out of the world, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Who is Yeshua? The living word of God. They have followed me. Your name is your authority, your character. I have manifested through my interaction with them. I have revealed who you are to them. And they've kept your word. Remember, when we speak of the name of God, it even goes beyond that. John 8, 58. Uh, <laughs> Yeshua said to them, truly, truly, I said to you before Abraham was born, I am. <laughs> Ech, echia. Um, the very name of God that he gives Moses at the burning bush. I am that I am. Am. Tell them I am sent you. So whether we're speaking of the character and the, uh, uh, the personality and who Yeshua uh, is revealing God to be, or whether we're actually speaking about the name, Yeshua has revealed it all. And truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, which the apostles have, he will never see death. Jesus answered and said to them, anyone who loves me, he will keep my word. We've seen this several times. Here is 14.23. My father will love him and will come to him and make our abode with him. Relationship. And that relationship kicks off with the apostles. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. What you have given me, what I, not everything I have is from you. It's a slightly different nuance here. My disciples now know everything you have given. What I have is because you've given me. I have nothing that you haven't given me, the son says. Everything you've given me is from you. Could have said everything I have is from you, but the emphasis is very clear here. The gracious gift of the father to the son. For the words which you gave me. Remember, Yeshua doesn't speak anything that he hasn't received from his father. So Yeshua is not just babbling, just not riffing uh, some teaching uh, out of thin air. When Yeshua speaks, he speaks the words that God gives him, the father gives him directly. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. I have delivered 
what you gave me. You gave me words, I've delivered it to my disciples. And they have received them and truly understood that I came forth. from. Now the disciples, at this point, they don't understand everything. They're not even prepared for the cross that's about to occur before the sun comes up, before the, uh, the, uh, the sun comes up that day. But they've truly understood this, that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. That's a fundamental, basic beginning of the gospel. Who is Jesus? Right? Before you talk about what Jesus has done, who is he? What is his point of origin? What is his mission and what is his significance? The disciples believe that the Father sent the Son. Remember, John 16, 28, just saw this last time. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. We did this in our summary of previous week. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. Right? Who Yeshua is, where it comes from, where he's been, where he's returning to, that's basic to the gospel. And regarding the discharge of receiving words from God and delivering them uh, as represented, Yeshua does this better than Moses. Moses represents God to the Israelites. And God gives him words and Moses gives them to Israel. Yeshua, being the living word of God, delivering the words of God, does one better. Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 19, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever does not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So Moses, what, 1,500 years before the time of Yeshua, promised Israel that there would be a prophet like him that would come, and he would be a second Moses, delivering the words of the Father, delivering the words of God. And if Israel was unfaithful, if they ignored the words of God's messenger, they were going to have to take it up with God himself. There would be justice exercised upon them. God would open up a can of justice on those who ignore his designated messenger, the prophet like Moses, whom Yeshua is. I ask on their behalf, who's Yeshua praying for? My disciples, the apostles. I do not ask on behalf of the world. That system that stands opposed to you, Father. Not that I don't love the world, right? Not that God doesn't love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have it. But I'm not talking about the world. I'm not praying right now about the world. I'm asking on behalf of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. This has been stated and repeated now several times. Get that message given Yeshua by God because we ultimately belong to him. And all things that are mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. This reminds me of what my wife told me when we first got married. What's uh, yours is mine. And what's mine is mine. But Yeshua is loving in all things, he says. This is the relationship that he has with the Father. All things that are mine are yours, and the things that are yours are mine. Intimacy. And I have been glorified in these disciples and in their faithfulness to me. So what is, I haven't heard a prayer yet for the disciples, what is Yeshua's petition for his Disciples, let's get right to it. What is Yeshua's petition? What is he asking God on, behalf, on their behalf? I'm no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. Yeshua speaks as if I'm already out of here, right? It's so close, I don't even consider that I'm still here in the world. I'm no longer in the world for all intents and purposes. But they, my disciples, my apostles, they're going to be in the world for a long time. Right? They themselves are in the world. And I come to you 
Holy Father. You've heard that expression, Holy Father. I'm sure you've heard that. Various faith traditions speak of a Holy Father. There's one Holy Father. Jesus refers to him. It's God himself. Holy Father. Only time we see Jesus use this language. Holy Father. But what's different about Holy Father than praying, hallowed be thy name? Same idea, right? Holy Father. Keep them in your name, the name which you've given me, that they may be one even as we are. Keep them in your character. Keep them as representatives of who you are. When people look at them, may they see you, may they see me through them, that they may be one, united, intimate, in relationship, even as we, Father and Son, are. While I was with them, however long Yeshua's ministry was, three years, three and a half years, a little shorter, whatever it was, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. I was revealing your character. And I guarded them. I watched over them. And not one of them perished. Well, actually one. But the son of perdition, the son of destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Who's he talking about? Judas, the son of perdition. Scripture would be fulfilled. What scripture? Psalm 41, 9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. We've seen this verse already quoted in chapter 13. John is... Uh, uh, focusing on the analogous uh, situation between David and the betrayal that he experienced and the son of David, the ultimate son of David, who experiences this kind of betrayal by a friend. So Psalm 41, 9. In other words, Judas did not sneak up on Yeshua. He didn't surprise Yeshua and say, guess what, I'm a traitor. Yeshua always knew, knowing the scripture, knew that he would be betrayed. Regarding son of perdition, the same word, destruction, we see it in the Gospels. Jesus uses this in Matthew 7, familiar passage. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, the way is broad, that leads to destruction. That's perdition, same word. And there are many who enter through it. Um, Paul uses this in regard to the Antichrist. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition. It's exactly the same phrase as Yeshua uses in uh, John 17. Son of perdition, the son of destruction. It means the same thing. Okay? It's like a type of, Judas, in a sense, is a type of Antichrist who is to come. Verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Jesus is really concerned regarding his disciples' level of joy. Fulfillment. Remember in John 15, 11, these things I've spoken to you, what I've spoken thus far, so that your joy may be in you, and my joy, rather, may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So the fullness of the disciples' joy. That's why Yeshua speaks what he speaks. Next time he uses this is just the previous chapter. One chapter later, verse 24 of 16, ask and you'll receive so that your joy may be made full. Yeshua is really concerned that the fullness of joy is a reality in the lives of his disciples. The world may have an angry face, but the disciples of Yeshua will be characterized by joy. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. They, they were of the world. The disciples, all of us were of the world before we were plucked from the system that stands in opposition to God until we changed allegiance. And so the world hates them. We betrayed the system of the world. We turned on the light. The fault 
position of uh, the world is darkness. We turned on the light. Ah, I hate the light. Because I hate the light, I hate you. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Following Jesus, our system has changed. It says this in John 15, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Everything you represent to the world gets on the world's nerves. They refuse to hear what you have to say because they truly cannot handle the truth. And so we as followers of Yeshua, we are giving the world Yeshua's truth. They can't handle the truth, and so they get upset with us. Don't get rattled. It's a great old Norman Rockwall, right, of uh, uh, choosing teams, right? And it's time for us to choose sides because following Yeshua necessarily entails choosing sides. Between what? Between him and the world. We are we're of the world, we're still in the world, so that, hence comes the drama, hence comes the conflict. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Yeshua is truly out of this world, so we are the ones who have chosen sides between him and the world. Whose side are you going to be on? Whose side are you on? There are some of you watching this right now. You know, technically, you're on Yeshua's side. You intellectually identify with Yeshua and not the world. But, but, can anyone tell the way you're living your life, can anyone tell which side you're playing for? Are you playing for the world or are you playing for Yeshua? Can anyone actually tell? Let's think about Pledge of Allegiance, right? You see the kid, oh, Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, but uh, the concept of allegiance is huge. When was the last time you publicly or privately shared with whom your allegiance lies and why your allegiance lies where it does, right? Pledge of allegiance, oh, that's a mere formality. No, that's a way of living your life, how you choose to live your life. If you are in the world but not of the world, your allegiance is squarely with Yeshua. You have chosen his team. He's chosen you. The Father chose you even before that. So where does your elite, where is your heart line? You feeling like, well, I'm in the world, but uh, am I not of the world? Am I, I like to have one foot in the world and kind of of the world and of Yeshua. If you keep your feet so split apart, you're going to split your britches. You're going to split yourself. I recommend you do. You can, you can do that for so long, and then you got trouble. Last two verses. I do not ask you to take them out of the world. Yeshua is going to be out of the world. So don't take them out of the world. The whole point of being uh, 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 not of the world is not take them out of the world. They have to stay where they are because they're going to make fruit. So you're going to keep them in the world, but not of the world. So I do not ask you to take them out of the, don't remove them from the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Opposition is coming. Satan looking to devour Yeshua's church. Satan is looking to devour, to make mincemeat out of believers. And Yeshua is praying, oh Lord, help me walk that line. Keep them from the clutches, from the jaws of the evil one. First John 5 gives us a little encouragement, verse 19. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's why Yeshua, 
That's why Yeshua is praying this. Keep them. Deliver us from the evil one, right? Deliver them from the evil one. Deliver them from Satan. Because the whole world is in the power of the evil one. He is the ruler of this world right now. Even though technically Yeshua, by his death, burial, and resurrection, has defeated him, practically speaking right now, that's not reality. Right? That's future dominion. When Yeshua comes as king, but right now the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Keep my followers safe and secure. They are not of the world. They're like me, even as I am not of the world. So final question regarding whose team you on, regarding where your allegiance lies. Maybe you have pledged allegiance to Yeshua and you're living your life that way. But I want you to do a little self-diagnostic right here. You don't have to go to the chiropractor. You don't have to go to the auto mechanic. I want to simply do a little spiritual diagnostic right now. I ask you a simple question that we're going to end at right now. Are you out of alignment with Yeshua? I walk around sometimes, terrible posture. You know I have terrible posture. You can see it every week, right? And sometimes, you know, I'm nearsighted, so I'm always, you know, getting closer to the computer screen or closer to the books or whatever. And, and so my shoulders are stooped sometimes. And, uh, sometimes I have terrible pains in my neck. And say, yes, yeah, Steve, you are a big pain in the neck. We know that. Uh, but sometimes I have a big pain in my neck or in my shoulders and, uh, because... My body is out of alignment. I have to straighten my posture. I have to, rem have to remind myself to straighten up. And when I'm out of alignment physically, I'm miserable. And when we're out of alignment spiritually, we're miserable as well. So Yeshua is praying for his disciples. And through the millennia, through the centuries, this question pops out. Are you out of alignment with Yeshua? If the answer is yes, it's very easy. Ask Yeshua. Ask the Father in the name of Yeshua to help you straighten up and walk right. Not fly right. Stra straighten up and walk correctly in the power of of Yeshua and by his spirit. All right, we have to stop here. We'll pick it up next time, same place.